Turner. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's midday um, alumni spotlight um, featuring alumnus Thomas Aurelio Davis from the class of 2000, or excuse me, 1974, um, co hosted by the Latino Alumni Network and Athletic Development. Um, my name is Maya Hood. For those of you who don't know me, um, I graduated from the class of 2017 and 18. Um, I am the current student and alumni engagement coordinator for USD's Office of Alumni Relations. Um, I am also a former Lady Terrera representing um, USD women's basketball. Um, so before we sort of jump in, I also just really want to acknowledge that we are living in some difficult times. So I'm sending um, my thoughts and prayers um, to you all um, during this time. Along those lines, um, during this time, the Alumni Association staff is really just continuing our efforts to keep our Terreros engaged um, with and connected to the university. Um, so one of those ways that we are doing is highlighting USD alumni who are doing great work in the community. Um, in the alumni spotlight um, events, we get the chance to hear from our alumni, um, hear a little bit more about what they're doing and additionally have an opportunity for Q&A and have some further discussions with them. So just a few housekeeping items before we jump into the session. In addition to this live event, um, this program will be recorded and shared with the Alumni Association YouTube channel in the near future. Um, so thanks to those who are tuning in later. Um, we ask that you please keep your mics muted during the interview portion of the event. There will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end and we will do our best to answer all of your questions um, during that time. As far as your Zoom preference, I encourage you to adjust your Zoom settings to speaker view while you're just obviously seeing my face now. Um, you'll be able to see our featured um, speaker's face um, here shortly, and I want to make sure you're able to see them clearly. All right, without further ado, I'm happy to turn it over to fellow alumni Maria, who will be helping facilitate this live interview with Tom. Um, Maria graduated from the University of San Diego in 2014 with a degree in political science, ethnic studies, and a minor in Latin American studies. Um, Maria was one of the co-founders of the Latino Alumni Network. She previously served as a secretary and now serves as a treasurer for the Alumni Network. Maria, thank you for helping lead the charge today. If you haven't already done so, please feel free to unmute your mic and you can take it from here. Awesome. Thank you, Maya. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you, everybody, for being here today during lunchtime. Um, I don't mind if you're munching and, and listening at the same time. That's totally fine. Um, but I would now like to introduce our featured speaker um, for this great alumni spotlight program. Um, Thomas Aurelio Davis studied biology, received his teaching credential and played men's basketball at the University of San Diego. He is a former um, middle school and high school bilingual uh, science teacher, coach, administrator, grant writer, and businessman and lifelong learner. His passion center around mentoring and coaching equal opportunity for all underrepresented communities, STEM, English learners, technology for teaching and learning, students with special needs, and students at risk of not completing their education. Tom currently serves as a director of business development at the Center for Educational Innovation in New York. His primary goals are to keep the nonprofit organization financially stable and to bring innovative products and services to K through 12 education. He is also the founder of Net for Ed Access, an education consulting firm based in San Diego. Tom, thank you for joining us today. Um, so I guess the question that we've all been asked this, this entire year, how are you doing during these difficult times? Um, how, how have you managed during this time? Uh, thank you, Maria, and thank you, Maya, for the uh, introductions. First of all, before we start, I'd love to do a shout out to everybody on the call right now. It's great to see uh, Enrique Morones, Ricky Gardner, Kenny Smith, Pat Moore, one of my students, my good friend, best friend, Bobby Bowen, his wife, Mary, she's called, they're calling down from um, Baja, California right now. My old classmate, Maureen Gardner, great to see you, Maureen, so awesome. Christopher Yanoff. Great leader for, uh, for, for students you know, at risk, done some great work with uh, reality changers. My son, Glenn Davis, uh, in New York, there he is, Stan, look at that beautiful guy there in New York. My son, Taylor Davis, Bradley Schoen, some good friends, Sammy Scholl, Coach Scholl, John Rodi, Mary Valerio, these are all 
Andy Kurz, who I play basketball with every Sunday morning. Ronnie Carragher, Coach Carragher, hope you're doing well. Anyhow, shout out to all of you folks that are on the call before we start. But I think the key word for us, all of us this year, has been a, the word pivot, right? We have to pivot. We've been pivoting for the year and a half. And that's really hurt my, uh, my, mid, my, my midsection because I've been eating a lot and not working out. So we're getting fat. But other than that, you know, Glenn keeps me honest. So does Taylor. And I think that's been, it's been interesting and tough year for everybody, but I think we're getting through it. We're seeing the light into the tunnel now. And, and I do believe that it's going to be a, a, a better year next year. That's great to hear. And yes, we've, we've all gained a little bit of weight down in that midsection. So um, hopefully all of this will be done soon. But, you know, we're again, like Maya said, we're, we're all kind of praying and, and keeping everybody in our thoughts and prayers to make sure that we can that all will this, all of this will pass soon. Um, but thank you again for being here today. Um, and we just kind of want right, to get right into it, right? So um, we, we know that you're you're a kid from National City. So we, we want to hear a little bit more about what was your experience like, especially being a scholar athlete at USD and being a, a, a kid from National City. So if you can share a little bit more about that. Yeah, so growing up, and my friends know this, uh, but I had, uh, my grandmother had 18 children. My mother was one of uh, 18 kids. There were 10, 10 boys, eight girls. So I love telling the story. When I grew up in National City, I was playing in the streets with all of my cousins because I have about 100 primos and primas, you know, all in the streets. And I, I liken the way I grew up in National City on 16th and Hoover Avenue to, uh, we called it the, uh, you guys have all heard of the Kennedy compound in the Hyannisport, right? We had the Barajas compound in National City because I had all my cousins and all my people were there. We would go to my grandmother's house and she would make for us. She'd always had a big pot of beans in there or the big ham hock in there. She's always making tortillas. And that's where we hung out was my, my abuelita's house, my, my grandmother's house. And, but they, but, but so I was always the, the, the odd guy out. I was, a, they called me Hirafa cause I was so tall. I was always gangly and the odd guy out. And they called me Patty boy cause I was Irish, right? My father's Irish and mother's Mexican. So even though I was always kind of like the, the dual part we're going to talk about later is, I always identify with the Mexican culture because that was what I grew up in. My mother spoke uh, Spanish, my grandmother spoke no English. So I had heard Spanish and you know, just was hanging around a bunch of Latino kids. And so growing up from there, it was really kind of interesting because I was uh, really, you know, really kind of out of place. I was kind of like a gangly tall kid. My cousins were little short, little chaparitos. So it was kind of interesting growing up in that culture for me. So I'm very, very, I'm very lucky actually that I got to experience that. So. Growing, coming from there, going to USD and going to St. Augustine, and we'll talk more about that, and going from there to USD was really, really powerful for me, and I was very fortunate and very humbled by that experience. Thank you for sharing, Tom. And yes, definitely the, having that big family is something very uh, that, that we can all relate to, especially coming from that Hispanic Latino culture. Um, I wanted to hear a little bit more about your your experience as a scholar athlete at USC and just balancing that life of being a student, especially a biology major, and also being an athlete, right? I know a lot of those two roles are very demanding. And so if you if you can share a little bit more about just being a, a, a student, a Chicano student at, a, a, at USD, while also still having that commitment of being an athlete as well. No, for sure. But see, when I was going to USD, my name was Tommy Davis, right? Tom Davis, they didn't know I was Latino. So it was uh, kind of interesting for me because, you know, most of my classmates, Kenny Smith, you know, we had a bunch of brothers on the team, you know, you know, a couple of white guys here and there, you know, Roddy Modick, Rick Garner on the team, Bobby Bowman, you know, white guys. <laughs> but it was really cool when they found out that I was Latino. I never forget our, our, my, my teammate, Stan Washington, when he found out, when he came to my house, my mom made some enchiladas. He goes, are you, are you Latino? Are you Mexican? And I go, yeah. And he, and he, and he goes, he started calling me, he started calling me Chicano, Chick. He called me Chick. Are you Chicano? I go, yeah. So it was funny. Marie, you remember Stan Washington. I know you remember Pinky and Stan and all those guys. Anyhow, uh, that's, that was interesting for me. So uh, it was not until, uh, you know, I started getting into uh, the, the biology major where I had to start managing my time because it was a lot. Every class I took had a lab. I mean, I, these are four hour labs. So I remember I spent a lot of time, you know, going to practice and, and going right to class and doing the lab. So your time 
I got really good at time management. So that's really how I kind of managed it. But thank goodness for, uh, you know, some mentors and coaches and people around me that helped me, my study group that helped me get through all that because biology was a hard major. It still is a, a very tough major, especially, um, you know, when you don't really have those role models um, to kind of, um, you know, that have paved the way. But luckily you were able to find that support group to, to support you a little bit um, during your time there. Um, and so I wanted to, to touch a little bit on, on the duality of your identity. You, you mentioned that you're um, Irish and Mexican. So, um, and, and just kind of hear a little bit more about how your, the duality of your identity um, shaped your experience as a scholar athlete at, at USD, you know, the different friend groups that you had, um, that kind of almost having to code switch between, you know, being in class and interacting with your professors and then interacting with your, with your classmates, your teammates, um, and, you know, the, kind of being a little bit in, in, in split into the, those two different worlds. So if you can share a little bit more about um, just that duality that you kind of had to navigate through during your experience at USD. 100%. And I, I do believe that there's a, I didn't know growing up there, going to school then, but, you know, you said the key word code switch. I think we all had to do that at some point, you know, for code switching, if you look at the term, what it means really is like infusing a different language or you know, Spanish into English or other way around or whatever it is, but just, but culturally code switching, you know, getting along with everybody on the team was a big deal. You know, we had African-Americans, we had people from all different kinds of cultures on our team. So we learned how to, how to do that all together, I think. One of the major things that I remember doing though at, at school was, because uh, this is, when I was going there in 1970, when I got recruited by Coach Wolpert and Coach Bickerstaff, uh, it was a very turbulent time in America. We were anti everything. We were anti government. We were, you know, we were picking, boycotting grapes and lettuce. Remember that, Enrique? We were like marching with Cesar Chavez. We were, we were like anti everything. You won't see a picture of me in the yearbook at USC because I was anti yearbook. <laughs> no pictures in there. We didn't want to go get my picture taken because I was anti that too. So we were anti everything. But right, Bobby? We didn't want to be a part of fraternity or anything like that. We, we just wanted to go to school and play hoops, you know? So anyhow, make a long story short, we, we learned how to code switch. We learned how to get along in basketball, you know, like all sports, Coach Carragher can tell you about athletics and football, how it brings everybody together and teaches everybody about life skills. And that's the beauty about being an athlete is the life skills that we learn and, uh, and what we can, uh, we can take forward in our, in our lives and careers. So, cause we know how to compete. I know how to compete. That's what I got out of, you know, going to you know, playing hoops there is learning how to compete and learning how to lose, learning how to win, those kinds of things. Right. And then you, you mentioned, you know, you were anti everything, just the climate of, of things, the, the current events at that time uh, was very much uh, politicized almost, kind of how, how we've seen a lot of the things happening now. Um, but can you share a little bit more about um, just like where you found those networks, that's those support groups? Um, you mentioned, you know, your basketball buddies, but just any student organizations or programs or offices at USD that that maybe kind of helped you either acclimate to, to being, um, you know, a student at USD or just kind of being, um, I'm not sure if you were a first generation uh, student, um, of, you know, college student, but if you can just share a little bit more of like where you found those supports and like where you kind of leaned on um, when, when you kind of didn't really know what to do, either whether that was as a student or whether that was, you know, during political movements. So I was very fortunate because I lived in, I grew up in San Diego, I'm a native of San Diego in Mercy Hospital in 1952. And, uh, and so, uh, I, but I lived on campus. And so it was very fortunate. That's why I met Bobby and you know, all my friends there, Robbie Moore, uh, you know, the, I met the, the whole crew there. We, we had a great time in the dorms there. So I was fortunate, I could go home on weekends. So unlike other people that commuted to the school, I could go home. So I had kind of a really cool life. I was really very lucky. I used to hang out Rob Moore's couch and Bobby's couch all the time when I you know, got kicked out of my dorm room by Ben Smith, I mean, by Ben Thompson, I mean, my roommate. Anyhow, uh, the, the cool thing about, about the, what was going on there at that time was Metsa was on campus and the Black Student Union was on campus. I think we had two, two groups basically at that time. And there was only a handful of folks in that group. Kenny, you remember that, the Black Student Union? And, uh, and, and, uh, and we had Metsa, I think that was pretty much it. So I would go in there and check that out. But my fraternity, like I said, was the basketball team. I hung out with those guys. We, that's what we did. That was my group. 
And I was anti-fraternity. I didn't want to join any fraternity at all. They would come knocking on your door, try to join. That's nah, not me. So really that's, and, the, and really what helped me a lot in, with my academics in the school was the guys that I studied with, you know, because we, we, these guys that I was with way over my head uh, were pre-med guys. And I, what am I doing in that, with these pre-med guys? Those guys are all doctors and dentists and stuff now, you know? So it's like, it was pretty amazing being involved with those guys. And those guys got me through a lot of courses. You know, so we really enjoyed uh, the time. And I can really share this, that I really learned, that's why I think it's important now from my peers, from, you know, for like a bit majoring in that, bio, in that field, the people around me got me through. So I think there's a whole, enough to be said about uh, bringing back peer-to-peer -peer support groups and kids teaching kids, you know, in schools and stuff and helping kids get through difficult content areas. Yeah, and it totally reflects the, some of the work that you that you're already doing now, and and kind of like the career path that you chose. Um, just trying to be like that network or that support for for other students, right, who are underrepresented. So um, I know you you mentioned a little bit of of how some of your passions are centered around. Um, equal opportunity for, for underrepresented communities and, you know, and especially in the STEM field, um, kind of similar to how you, you know, you had that, that support group that you could lean on, those buddies that, that were part of the, the biology group, right, the study, the study buddies um, who kind of helped guide you guide you through, um, you know, navigating that, that route of being a, a student um, in biology. So uh, can you just share a little bit more about maybe some of the, the opportunities that you've created for students of color in that field of STEM, especially since we know that uh, a lot of students who are of color, um, you know, who come from underrepresented communities um, have a, a difficult time being even entering in the STEM fields, right? And then how, how the retention rate of, of students in the STEM fields. And so if, if you can just share a little bit more about the, the opportunities that you have created for students um, in that field. Well, absolutely. So the, the first thing I remember though is the reason why I became a bio major is because my father, my father was in the hospital field and he pushed me into biology. He kept telling me, go, 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 go. I told my son Glenn, he needs to be a bio major too. And he did it. You know, he went through there, but he, now he sells real estate in New York. <laughs> so, but the reason why I got into, I got into uh, uh, biology is my father. You know, that's the reason why. So if somebody's not pushing you, particularly in, in low income and, and, and uh, low socioeconomic communities, if they're not, nobody's pushing you in that area, you know, once you get into it, here's my theory about this. I think kids, when you, when you get into a STEM field or a STEAM field, it gets very difficult after a while. I mean, organic chemistry is probably the hardest class in the whole world. History of the world is organic chemistry. Coach Shaw, you would know all about that. I know. Uh, uh, yeah. So, but, but, I, but I think what happens is if you don't have study groups, because your parents can't help you, if you have a tough question, you got to go to somebody that can help you with this. So it's going to be a peer group or somebody that can give you the answers to a question right now. So with that thought in mind, for me, um, what I want to do is create these support groups and mentors and role models for, for kids of color to be able to go into a STEM field. And what motivated me to go into that work was the fact that we have maybe close to a thousand biotech companies here in San Diego County but less than 8% of the people working in those jobs are black or brown. So we gotta change that. We gotta get kids and families to understand and embrace STEAM activities when they're in kindergarten and all the way through. So they can go into a, into a school like USD, major in a STEM field, engineering, chem, chemistry, fit, whatever, you know, get their degrees, come back to San Diego you know, as the CEO of a company and create jobs. And that'll lead to peace and prosperity in San Diego forever. So the people need to work. So that's the motivation I have. So we created, I'm doing, doing some work now in National City where I grew up with the school district there, National School District, about 5,000 students, and then Sweetwater Union High School District where I taught at Sweetwater High School. And we created a program called National City 16 Weeks of Steam.org. You can check it out, I'll put it in the chat. So we're trying to get families, even over COVID now, to be able to, to do activities around STEAM in their homes with their kids uh, with materials they can find around the house. So we're trying to get kids interested in, in that and in, in keeping that going over time, you know, working that curiosity that they have and then extending it over time into Sweetwater High School and the Master City Middle School and High School and then go maybe go to UCSD or USD or San Diego State or wherever, come back as a, as a STEAM major somehow. That's the goal we have. So next year we're going to work on uh, engineering and, and mathematics and coding. This year is more focused on the four ecospheres, you know, uh, hydrosphere, atmosphere, uh, the geosphere and the, and the, and the biosphere. Now we're, we're now in the, 
the, the last month of the biosphere, we launched this in February, we're in our last month right now, we're excited about this. We have about 500 families that are doing the work. So we got to start. We're excited about that. So that's the kind of stuff we're doing uh, to, uh, to give back. Partnering up with UCSD, I want to partner with USD in terms of getting interns to come and do some work with us there and getting into the field and supporting kids as mentors and role models. Yeah, so definitely very much still along the lines of, of you, you giving back to the community, right? Because you're a National City Kid and you want to foster, you know, those future generations of students who can also go into the STEM field and already be prepared, right? Because oftentimes there's students that like yourself, you know, how you said, you know, you, you kind of came into bio, you were struggling and luckily you were able to find that support system, but there's students that, that don't have that, that opportunity. So you're creating that opportunity before they even start college. Um, and so it's very much along the lines of you giving back. So I kind of wanted to hear maybe what's some advice that you have for students who are coming from those underrepresented communities, um, you know, similar to myself and any other students who, who might be on here today. Uh, what, are, what is some of that advice that you would share with them um, so that they can continue to thrive, whether that's in the STEM field or just, you know, being in the higher education field um, as a student of color, as a first generation student, as you know, someone who's coming from, from a low-income community, but what is some of that advice that you'd want to share with, with some of us today? No, after that, join LAND, join Latino Alumni Network, join uh, the Black Student Union, join, you know, whatever group that, you know, that you relate to, find that, that, that support group around campus, for sure. So any, any students that are listening to this, this, this uh, session, this Zoom, for sure, uh, identify with uh, some group. You can't do this alone. You need help. So look for an affinity group that you relate to, you know, stay with that group. Um, one of the things that I think is important is, uh, because I didn't know what I was gonna do when I got out of college. I don't think anybody really does. You know, I had a major, but I didn't know what I was gonna do, you know? So uh, thank goodness I owe a lot to Father Patrick Kane, our principal at St. Augustine, who called me up over the summer and said, hey, I got a job teaching and coaching for you. And that guy, I owe that guy my life because he got me into education because I didn't know I was gonna be a teacher. I had no idea. Uh, so setting things happen. So, you know, I just think you need support groups. You know, my friends here on this call, you know, that have been their lifelong friends. That's probably the, main, the most important thing that I can say from USD that I got. I have lifelong friends, probably more so from, you know, uh, USD than I do from high school. And, and you, do you mind maybe sharing a little bit more about some of those mentors that, that really made an impact? I know when we, when we first talked, when we were prepping for this, you mentioned a couple of names of, of folks, coaches and, and teammates and, and other folks that, that really made an impact on you and really like, you know, pulled you um, to, to kind of be the greater version of yourself during, during that college time. So if you can share just a little bit of, of some of those names or some of those folks that, that you, you, you see as mentors and maybe you still, you saw as mentors back then. Absolutely. There's a couple guys, they're going to hold me accountable. So I can't tell any lies right now because they, they know the stories already, you know, so I can't go, I can't tell too many lies, but, you know, I was very fortunate because I remember, you know, when I got to USD, Coach Phil Wolpert was the AD at USD back in the 60s and 70s. He came from USF. He coached Bill Russell and Casey Jones and, you know, some great litany. Coach Cunningham, John Cunningham, probably the biggest mentor for me, Coach Cunningham um, at USD. But uh, so fortunate to have Coach Wolpert come to my house, eat some enchiladas with my family and invite me to come to USD because Bernie could, Coach Pickers house couldn't be there. So I think he was a role model because of him, I started looking at what Bill Russell was. And Bill Russell was probably my all-time favorite player um, because he won so many championships and he was a great defensive player. And that was my game. When you can't score, you play defense and you rebound. That's what your job is, right? When you can't shoot, right, Bobby? You got you to gotta, you gotta just give the ball up and play defense. You got to know what your role is, right, Coach? So my role was defense and rebounding. And, and so I knew my role. Because we had, you know, we had Pinky Kenny's brother. Pinky was our big scorer. And we also had Stanley Washington. Those two guys averaged 50 points between those two guys. I don't need to score. You know what I mean? So you got to find your role, what your role is. But so, uh, so I do think the, uh, I do think the, uh, the, the this experience of play, being on the team and, 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 and being a part of the school, you know, my best friends, you know, are on this call. A lot of them are on, my, on this call right now. And, and so some more names I'll throw at you. Um, my teammate Stan Washington, you know, great, great player, probably one of the best players of all time in the history of USD basketball. If we had the three-point line, 
he'd be still the all-time leading scorer because we did he did he was the all-time leading scorer up until a couple of years ago with no three-point line and we couldn't dunk back in 1970 it's really hurt my game you know i was a vertical player coach so uh you could probably get a diamond in my jump coach so probably like that now glenn my son glenn and taylor can jump but i didn't get that gene i was well below the rim but anyhow the the uh so, so great players like him and mentors. And then growing up when I was in eighth grade, I remember Rico Cabrera. I used to go watch him play. He was the first Latino that I could relate to that played for USD against the San Diego State teams. And, and we would always beat San Diego State back then. That was a big rivalry. But Rico Cabrera, the first Latino, I could identify with him. I wanted to be like Rico. Uh, Gus McGee, who was our, ended up being our coach. Coach Bickerstaff, huge influence on me. The cool thing about Coach Bickerstaff was he was 25 years old, 26 years old when he was coaching us. We were all 18, 19 years old. We had a guy on the team older than him that came from the Navy. So Coach Bickerstaff kind of growing with him as we kind of went through school. Then my senior year, he left to go to the NBA. But, you know, just a great experience with him. He was a great role model for us. Um, and then, uh, you know, the guys I went to school with, Kenny Smith, you know, his brother Pinky. Uh, ben Thompson, my roommate for, for so many years, passed away, I, I, sad to say. Uh, but we had some good teams and we really enjoyed winning. And, and that was part of it as well. So those are some names I throw out there. Uh, you know, Skip Laurie, my teammate, uh, you know, some great teammates we had in the past, some, some characters we had. Uh, Guy Simpson, we had some really interesting players. Uh, uh, Rick, Rick uh, uh, Sabosky, remember him, Bobby? Uh, some good players we had. It was fun playing there. So I could throw a bunch of names out. But as far as the guys who impacted me the most were probably Coach Bickerstaff, Coach Cunningham, Coach Bervelli. I remember Coach Cunningham, what I loved about him the most was he would, when we were taping up before practice, he would always talk to me. I would love going in there. Just He would just say things, talk about life. So I learned really a lot from him, just listening to him tell me about things that going on in life. And he would take, while I was taking me, he's telling me stories. A lot of guys didn't like that, but I liked it. Because Coach Cunningham, you can get you can get after it after a bit. Coach so you know what I'm talking about. Coach Cunningham gets after it a little bit. But a lot of the lessons he taught me were, you know, right during those taping sessions, just listening to him when he's taping me. So, you know, th those are pretty pretty good examples. I'm probably missing out on a couple of folks, but you know, those are those are the main guys that I think. Coach Bravelli, he came my senior year. You know, he's he's a great guy. He went Bernie left. Coach Bravelli came in, had a big impact on us as well. Thank you for sharing, Tom. Yes, it's definitely so, so important. It sounds like you still have a lot of those people very near and dear to your heart, and you know, always on your mind. I, I know you you love sharing that part of your life and uh, with us, and so thank you. For Thank you for doing that. I did want to ask because I know in the registration um, page, there was a little fun fact about you. It says Tom is an avid basketball player and represented Mexico on the over 64 national basketball team, which finished sixth in the FIMBA World Championship in Helsinki in 2019. So can you share a little bit more about, you know, just you representing Mexico in that tournament and just kind of like what it felt, you know, to, to kind of be uh, uh, back in, in the basketball game after so many years. And yeah, if you can just share a little bit more about that. Yeah, my wife, Karen, she, she called it the Tom Davis Vanity Tour, that's what she called it. So, uh, you know, it's like going back and trying to play some hoops when you're still old. When, but you know, it's like watching paint dry, watching old guys play basketball. You know, they're probably better watching paint dry. But, you know, because you try to make those moves and you're still kind of going like slow motion. It's like, watching Enrique Morones run, you know, it's like slow like that. Anyhow, it was really cool because there were 18 teams in our division from all over the world. And these guys are all over 64 years old. And so we were out there running around competing. It was fun. And we uh, made it to the medal round. We beat Japan, we beat Uruguay, and we beat Brazil B. And then we lost to uh, Brazil A. And we played for fifth place in the medal round. And we lost to, to – uh, to Ukraine, they had a big six eight, eight guy I had to guard. So I was one of two Mexican Americans allowed to play on the team. I had to show my, you know, my my grandmother's, you know, birth certificate and stuff. They allowed two Mexican Americans to play from San Diego. Most of the team was from Mexico. We had guys from Jalisco and from Sonora and from Culiacan, all over. It was kind of fun. So we were all practicing in Tijuana, 
I go down to Tijuana, you know, one, twice a week and go down with the team. Guys would all come in and we practice and got ready for it. And we had a great time. So I got to visit Stockholm, Sweden. We went to uh, Copenhagen and we ended up in uh, Estonia and then finishing up in Helsinki, Helsinki for the tournament for about 10 days. So we had a great time. Like, like I said, my wife, you could hear her laughing in the background when I would fall or do something stupid. You could hear her, you know, kind of laughing in the background when she was taking video. She got a kick out of it, but it wasn't her favorite time because she didn't want to watch watch a bunch of old old guys running around playing basketball, you know, in in Europe. So anyhow, it was fun. We had a good time and I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed representing Mexico. That's great that you got to be able to show that part of your identity, especially, you know, playing with other other players who, you know, share that same love for, for the sport. And so um, I'm sure it was such a great experience. I wish I could see some of those videos that, that your wife caught. Um, so well, I don't think you saw it's like slow motion, man. I sent him to buy all these guys. Like they saw me. I put a move on an old 80-year-old guy, man, went right around him, <laughs> right around that old dude. And the team would call me Galacho Feo. Galacho Feo. <laughs> They, I'm sure they, they had a, a lot of deep love for you after after seeing you play. Um, but thank you for sharing a little bit about that experience. And just, again, your love for basketball, we can see that it radiates through you. Um, but I, I, I also wanted to kind of get back a little bit on the on the education and just kind of some of, of the work that you've done because of your passion in education. And, um, you know, given that you are the director of business development at the Center for Education in New York, um, and you started your own edu uh, your own education consulting firm, the Net for Ed Access. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about why it's important to give back to your community and why specifically with education? Um, and just share a little bit more about your desire to see more equity in education, um, and you know how that role played played in that in that Net for Ed Access founding founding of of the Net for Ed Access. And you know again, just a little bit more of of students of color in education and, you know, underrepresented students um, and just your support um, for, for seeing equity in education. You know, just having role models like Christopher Yanoff on the call right here. He's a guy, a great role model for, for a lot of what we're trying to do in transforming getting kids to college and kids of color to have equal access. So the three big buzzwords right now that we talk about are diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those are the three things we've always been talking about. So I kind of lived that when I was teaching. I taught for 15 years at yeah, Sweetwater High School in National City and at St. Augustine, and I taught at uh, Poway Unified one year. But through the educational pieces, you can see the inequities. You know, we've been trying things for 30, 40, 50 years, and they don't work. So a lot of it's social economics. So, but how do we level the playing field with quality curriculum and content and good teachers to level the playing field so everybody has equal access to get to USD? USD is hard to get into. I'm lucky I got in there. Can't believe I got in there. Probably because I played hoops, probably as I got in. But I don't know how Bobby or Rob Moore got in. I can tell you that much. Uh, and Ricky, 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 uh, Ricky Garner like, was on a baseball scholarship, and so was Ron Modick. Those guys can see how they got in. Maureen, probably, Maureen, you're probably a smart girl. You got in because you were academically, you know, there. Come on, Maureen. Uh, but uh, I, I think that I've been seeing the inequities, just being a teacher and seeing, you know, that it's not fair. Not a, it's not an equal system. So the work we're doing now is around transformation. We're trying to do transformational work. The, the, best, the best thing we can do right now, I think, is train our teachers to be the best teachers they can be. We can't, we've got to have a teacher in the classroom. We can't, technology's not ever going to change that. We've got to have good teachers. You know, we have to have, uh, they have to be qualified with good resources, understand how to do what a doctor does, how to diagnose an issue and prescribe a solution and a fix for it. You know, so we've got to be more like doctors and be able to use the technology to, to look at the analytics and be able to figure out how to do that best for kids that have needs. So I think the technology is important, but I do believe that the transformation really is around changing mindsets of teachers and building a better teacher. So that's the work, kind of work that we do. We do tutoring services. We have to do school after school programs. We do a lot of uh, contract work around transforming. We've taken over eight charter schools right now we have in New York. So we get calls from the state to take over charter schools. So we've been doing that work. Um, uh, in, in New York City. We have contracts with the DOE there to, to do support work around those areas I mentioned in PD and, and, and staff development and, and tutoring and after school programs and boost programs with the underperforming schools in New York City. So I want to bring that to San Diego. We're going to bring that to California and do the same work here in, in California. 
Yeah, especially helping a lot of those um, immigrant communities, right, that uh, oftentimes don't have those those opportunities. And, you know, that, that you saw as a kid um, when you were growing up in, you know, down in, in National City and, and just being able to be provided just simply with, with the opportunity to, to even have that access to education. So thank you for sharing that, Thomas. Um, and then um, kind of going into a, a little bit back into USD, um, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about how your USD education and your involvement um, kind of decided or, or shaped your, your decision to, to then become involved with Latino Alumni Network. For those of you that don't know, Tom was very supportive right from the start. We're a very young organization, um, student organization, or not student, alumni organization um, at USD. We started in 2015, 2016, and Tom was right there from the start, ready with, you know, with so much energy and action. So if you can just share a little bit more about um, your desire to see more, more Latino students in higher education, your involvement with, with LAN, and just how your USD education kind of shaped your, your career successes and, and you know, kind of how it played a role in, 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 your, in your life. 100%. I, I do think that when a new freshman comes to USD, they got to have an affinity group. So, you know, I remember, you know, like I said, five or six people in Mecha. So we have to start some sort of a scholarship program or some sort of a, a place to go to when you're a Latino kid you have, and you're by yourself and you're not, you're not, there's nobody you can relate to, right? So, and now with the demographics changing, you know, more Latinos getting into the school, you're seeing a lot more Latinos and African-Americans coming to the school. There's gotta be a place for them to go to to get some help and resources and things. So the only tip behind LAN for me was to try to start, you know, endowment and scholarship program to, to help kids, give them scholarships, or put maybe a meal ticket or something that the kids need. We, might, we need more support. We need more Latino kids coming to the school. We need more African-American kids coming to the school. So a way to support them, they could apply for scholarships, you know, maybe a meal ticket or transportation, whatever they need to get to school to remove the barriers for them to be successful uh, at USD. So that's why we started it. I do think that the, the, the intention is to, for me personally, is to try to mentor and coach up some kids that are interested in ed tech. If they want to go into ed tech, I'm happy to be there to help them, you know, open some doors for them and get them into that space, you know, engineering, any STEM fields. Uh, I'd love to help in those areas. So to give back to that would be really powerful for me as well. So I, I do think that's important. Um, you know, my mother taught me to give back. We, we learned that at an early age. We got that at St. Augustine too, you know, to give back. Um, so that's what we're doing. Now, I'm getting to the age now. I'm not as old as Enrique, though, but, uh, you know, we got to give back. Yeah, definitely. And, and that giving back, right, because I know when I graduated in 2014, I was so surprised that there was no Latino alumni network, right? And so um, having been able to be part of, of that founding group and then seeing you and then bring other folks along, um, who are so excited to be there. And from all the events that we've been having over Zoom and just, you know, back when, when we did, we were able to get together in homecoming and all that stuff. So um, it's just really great to have that network because again, sometimes we don't, coming from those underrepresented communities, we don't have that support system. Our parents aren't, you know, typically doctors and lawyers and, you know, they don't have those connections. And so that's really kind of where land comes in is we were able to provide folks like you, like Enrique, like all these other folks who have been able to, you know, kind of be that, that um, network system and, and that support system for a lot of our students who kind of graduated and then they don't really have those connections of, okay, what do I do next, right? You mentioned how you, you didn't really know what was that next step um, when you were in college. So it, it's definitely great to kind of have those those mentors ready to, to help our students and our alumni. Let's and then- building. Yeah, we'll build it, build it, keep going, keep building it. More yeah. graduates, more alumni, more alums, more opportunity. Definitely, thank you for sharing. And I know you've already touched on a lot of great memories um, that you and your friends had during your SD, but maybe like just one, you know, favorite memory or your favorite experience uh, about being a USD student or something that's kind of like you you remember and you still laugh, um, that, that still kind of brings you those, those good memories. So just to kind of finish off before we go into Q&A, just something quick of a, a memory that you have from USD that, that you cherish. Oh, just the friends, you know, Bobby Bowman, you know, Rick Garner, you know, uh, Robbie Moore, uh, you know, uh, just the people that I met there, you know, Stan Washington, Kenny Smith, you know, Pinky Smith, his brother, 
Ben Thompson and Ricky Garner. I mean, I, these guys are all my buddies from there and we all had the same experiences. We're all, you know, student athletes, you know, just trying to go to school and have a good time. You know, it was very different then. In 1970, the school, you know, it just it came off the, they merged the, the college for women and college for men. So I definitely remember we had to go down to the college for women. We had to register, you know, John Rodee probably remembers those days. Um, we had to go down and uh, register. To, it was called parietal visitation rights. We had to go, to, if I wanted to go see you, Maria, I had to register to go check you out. Uh, so it was a very different time then. And, uh, and so I, I do think that the school has changed a lot. You know, we, my favorite spot on campus was going up to that. Maria, remember going out to that, the upper field up there, we'd fly our kites up there, where now it's the Joan Croc Center. That was an all empty field out there. We go out there and fly kites and just kind of hang out out there. That was a fun memory. And, but I just think the, the people that we've met, you know, the people yes. that we've met, you know, at the, the school, that's my biggest memory. Yeah, Maureen is saying the bluff. So yeah, I'm sure you, you all had a nice view, a lot less buildings back then. So I'm sure you, you could even see probably into the ocean too. Um, but yeah, thank you for sharing. I really appreciate it. It was such a pleasure and such an honor to, to, to get to know a little bit more about your story and um, you know how you continue to give back to the community. That's definitely um, something that that we're very appreciative of, um, and not just not just as a land representative, but also just as a you know a student who who would have enjoyed to have a mentor like yourself. Um, during my time in, in college and even in high school and at a younger age so that I could, I could be guided more. Um, but thank you so much. And thank you, Tom, for, for sharing your story. Um, and so now we're going to be going into the Q&A questions. So Maya, I believe you're going to um, get some of those questions that we've gotten uh, ready to go. Yes, thank you, Maria, um, for leading that. And Tom, um, thank you so much for um, sharing your story with us. Um, and it was awesome to hear about the amazing work that you're doing. And as a former um, fellow scholar athlete myself, it was really nice to hear and you touch on those experiences that you had um, from the university. Um, so as Maria said, I will be leading the Q&A portion of the program. Um, so if you do have any questions, now's the time to put them in the chat box. Um, in the meantime, we will start with those pre-populated questions submitted um, by the registration, um, by registrants. Um, so the first question that we have for you, Tom, is what was your greatest basketball highlight? There's a couple of them, but the one, probably the most important one for me was just being recruited by Coach Wolpert and Coach Bickerstaff because I wasn't that good. I really wasn't that good. So just being recruited by those guys was, was really a highlight for me. And uh, just getting to USD was a highlight for me from where I came from. So that's probably one of the biggest things. You know, we all had, I could talk about games, you know, I could talk about, you know, being in the zone and scoring X number of points, but that really wasn't it. It was really kind of the process for me. But the one thing I will share with you quickly is a highlight I'll never forget is when we were in high school at St. Augustine, we, we, we thought we were pretty good. Bill Walton was playing at Helix and we thought we could beat him. We never got to play and we lost in the CIF finals semifinals and we got to play him. So Bill, one of our guys knew Bill and Bill said, yeah, I got a key at Helix. Show up at nine o'clock at Helix High School. And we'll, our team against your team will go shirts and skins. We'll find out who the best team in San Diego is. So that's, I love that telling that story because they kicked our butts. They, 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 they were so good. They beat us up so bad. We walked out of there with our heads between our legs. And, but I love telling that story because who else had a key to the gym other than Bill Wall and we go play each other to find who the best team was on a Saturday morning at nine o'clock. And Bill had called the band, the guys are playing, the music's playing, kids are going crazy. They had a thousand people in their gym. It was a great story. I love telling that story. I said, I went to Bill later. I said, hey, Bill, why don't you put that story in one of your books? And he goes, Tommy, get out of the past. That was like 50 years ago, man. So I started laughing. Right. And, and he said, well, why would I put that in my book when I'm playing against Larry Bird and playing against the Chief and playing against the best player, Michael Jordan? Why would I put that story in my book? Because it's from San Diego. So now I ain't doing it. So anyway, I love telling that story. Basketball story. That's awesome. I love that. I, I sort of agree with you there. And, you know, going to USD and being a part of the basketball program there, I do have specific like games that were the biggest highlight, but I agree with you, the friendships and the relationships that you create out of that. I have teammates now to this day um, 
who I'm very close with, they're my best friends. And so we always talk about being in each other's weddings and all those important um, life um, uh, situations. So it's, I, I, I'm with you on that. So thank you for sharing um, that experience. Um, the next question that we have here is, and this might be a tough one, and I'm really interested to hear what your answer is going to be. Favorite basketball player of all time? I think I said it, Bill Russell. The reason why I love Bill Russell is because he's a winner. And he, he had a, a great, instead of, you know, possessions were important back then. So instead of swatting the ball out of bounds, he would tap it to himself and keep the rebound. So he kept the possession. I think that was really important. So I learned, I, 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 li I looked at, I saw how he did that. So defensively, that's what I was trying to do too. Instead of possessions were very important. You got to get the ball so you could score. Instead of swatting the ball out of bounds, he would tap it to himself and get, keep the ball. That's what I learned from Bill Russell. Nice. I, I, you know, I think we might have some people on this call that might disagree with you there, but that's, that's fine. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's a great option there. Um, let's see. The next question that we had, and this is just like a fun, lighthearted question. What is your favorite book and why? Oh yeah. That's a no brainer. I was in high school. We had a great teacher, Mr. John Bowman, who was a USC grad. He was in a, in an Ernest Hemingway. And so I got my son, Glenn, he actually did it. He actually ran with the Bulls in Pamplona. Uh, the Sun Also Rises, my favorite book of all time. And if you look at Glenn there, he's got a little tattoo, you know, he put on his back of the sun coming up because he ran with the Bulls in Pamplona and we got into that whole thing. And so that's a no brainer. I don't know how smart Glenn is for doing that because it was the dumbest thing I ever did was run with the Bulls in Pamplona because I read The Sun Also Rises. Nice. I love that. Um, let's see how next question here is um, how has campus changed since you attended USD? It's a night and day. I mean, it's an unbelievable school now. I mean, Kenny, you know, remember that, that Tecolote Canyon was like, now it's like all, all kinds of buildings and stuff in there. I mean, it's like, you guys remember it was like, a, it was like nothing there. I love the architectural design, but the school is like totally changed night and day. I mean, the Croc Center, the new uh, science, the, the new engineering building there. I mean, it's just unbelievable what's gone. The, the cutting out field, the, the Jenny Craig. We played in the old sports center. We loved that because after practice, we'd go right in the, into the pool, man, and start swimming. Except Kenny couldn't swim, so he almost yeah. drowned one time, you know. Yeah, the campus is, uh, is really beautiful, uh, really nice. I was struck by the kids sitting by the fire pits with their laptops and deep down, I knew they weren't studying, but you know, just the fact that they could sit around and enjoy it. It's a beautiful campus. And, um, you know, I'm glad I'm, I'm on this conference call, this Zoom. So I'll mute myself, but, but uh, nice to see everybody and uh, enjoy, enjoy seeing you again, Tommy. I tell you what, Kenny, I love you, my brother. And I, his brother, Pinky, was probably the best guy, the best person in the whole entire world. He never lost a sprint. You know, we'd run, you know, you run, you, you run your sprints after practice. He never lost a race ever in practice, ever. Never, nobody ever beat that guy. He That's passed true. away. Yeah, it's true. He passed away, unfortunately. But uh, congratulations to him and his brother, Kenny, because they're both in the Hall of Fame up in uh, Daly City. I'm glad I got to go to that ceremony. That was awesome for you, Kenny and Pinky and your family. Very proud of you guys. Okay. Good to see everyone. I'll just mute myself, but nice turnout. And I'll talk with you after again, Tommy. All right, All right Kenny. Okay, hey, love you. Hold on. Tommy, speaking of the uh, Hall of Fame, as future St. Augustine Hall of Famers, I wanted to uh, thank you. <laughs> You're well, killing me. That's all right. I'll never forget when I was in kindergarten and I would watch you sitting on the bench at St. Augustine. And I'd say, <laughs> what's the grace in that? But in all seriousness, I wanted to thank you for the great support that you've given the organizations that I've you know, been involved with, House of Mexico, Border Angels, and now Gente Unida. Gente Unida actually has a club at USD. So I encourage the students to participate. Friar Adolfo Mercado is in charge of it. He's a friar. He's studying religion there at, at USD. And I just want to thank you for everything that you've done and you continue to do because you're a true inspiration and we're all so proud of you. And, uh, and uh, I, I did have I'd asked a question previously, you kind of answered it. How St. Augustine 
uh, the great high school that you and I both went to. And then, as you know, I also went to USD. How that prepared you? How has St. Augustine prepared you for, for USD? That's a great question. But, you know, I think any good Catholic high school does that because what it did for me was it, it gave me the ability to question things, right? To think critically and to question things. Just don't take things rote as in verbatim to question everything that you're, you're taught and to, that you're trying to learn. So, I mean, that's what I got out of St. Augustine was the camaraderie. You know, one of my former students there, Pat Morin's on the call, very successful USD alum and, and, uh, and uh, it's on, the, on, on doing some great work with kids too after school. Uh, he can tell you the same thing. It's all about the camaraderie. Rick Garner and, and, and Ron Modick both went to Marion. They got the same thing. You guys thought critically and learn how to think and, and ask questions and question things. And I think that's what we got out of that. And, and the camaraderie, just being able to get along with different cultures and people, you know, is very supportive. That, and that, that helps a lot, I think. And then we have a foundation, you know, you know, I don't go to church every Sunday anymore. But I have a foundation, you know, from right and wrong. I have a foundation of, of, of ethics and morals, I think, that we got when, from when we were at the school. You know, I'm not a real big Catholic anymore because I don't agree with some of the things the church is doing, but that's a whole other conversation. Uh, but I do have a foundation, I think, of, of, of Christianity that is important. Thank you. Somebody asked what the group was called. Our group, Gente Unida. It's on the USD campus. Gente Unida. Thank you. And great work that you're doing, Enrique and, 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 and Christopher. Yeah, both you guys, man. You guys are both great, great stories in yourselves. And I, I give you guys a lot of credit and, and, and keep up the great work you guys are doing. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for all the great work that you're doing. Um, it's just nice to see um, the progress and the um, the wealth of the richness of what our alumni are doing. We have so many alumni um, from the university who are doing great things. And so I always appreciate the time to spend time with them, highlight them and celebrate all the work that they're doing. Um, so thank you all for everything. Um, if we don't have any other last minute questions, let me just do like a quick scan. We will continue to move forward. Perfect. Okay. Well, that does um, conclude our Q&A segment. Um, again, we just really want to thank you all for joining us today. A special, special thank you to Maria and Tom for making this event happen. Tom, it was a delight to hear um, from you, to hear about your scholar athlete experiences, the great work that you're doing, the foundation that you've set at USD um, with the Latino Alumni Network and many other organizations. Um, I know that everyone on this call really appreciates you and the work that you are doing and continuing to do. Um, just to wrap up here again, we will um, share this recording um, for this session on our Alumni Association YouTube channel at a later date. And I also want to share a snapshot here of the um, upcoming uh, Alumni Association event, virtual programs that we have. Um, they vary again from Alumni Spotlights, like this awesome one that we just had with Tom, LinkedIn workshops. Um, we also have a regional roadshow co-hosted by the College of Arts and Sciences and um, the USC Alumni Association Regional Torero Clubs um, and a bunch of other events that we have as well. Um, so for more information on programming, visit alumni.sandiego.edu. Lastly, don't forget to connect with the Alumni Association, the, the Latino Alumni Network, and USC Athletics to stay up to date with all things related in those respective areas. Um, there will be a follow-up, a thank you email that will include all the resources, links, and contact information for Tom. So should you want to um, follow up with him for additional questions or connect with him further, um, in the meantime, we hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you for spending um, this hour with us um, today. And we hope that you all stay healthy, take care, and um, we hope to see you soon at a virtual program.